Hey, everybody. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll start off a question with a question here. Um, are you, ooh, first I'll turn on my clicker. There we go. Uh, are you new to, to RxJS? Um, when you're using it, do you feel lost, helpless, alone? <laughs> I'm Ben Lesh. I'm here to help. Um, I'm very excited about this. It, actually, a lot of people know me from the web, uh, and they might not believe I'm Ben Lesh, so it's me. <laughs> it's really me. I, I, brought, I brought the hat. I don't always wear the hat. Um, I do at conferences. Otherwise, people don't know who I am. Um, so how long have you been using uh, RxJS? Uh, who here has been using it for longer than a month? All right, let's keep our hands up. How about longer than six months? Longer than a year. Oh, it's going down. Longer than two years. Is there even one? Where are you? Oh, stand up. All right. <laughs> that's awesome. How about longer than five years? OK, that's not even me. All right. Um, I've, I've been using it for, for a little more than two years, more or less. That surprises some people, I suppose, but it's true. Um, but RxJS is actually more than nine years old. Uh, it was created by Matt Podwasecki a long time ago as, as part of uh, Microsoft Project Volta, which was targeting uh, compiling C Sharp to JavaScript. Um, so they wanted to compile Rx.net to JavaScript. So not too long ago, I was, I was pretty new to this. And questions I asked whenever I was new to this was, the first question I asked was, what the hell is this, another Lodash? Why, like, why do I need this? I, I looked at it, and it looked exactly like Lodash to me at first blush, and you know, maybe I didn't dig, in it, dig into it too deeply. And then once, once I did get into it, um, I started asking this question all the time. What operator do I use for that? Or how do I do this the Rx way, right? Um, why did that observable die? I put a catch in there. Uh, it, it shouldn't be dead now. I, it should just keep going, right? Uh, what is this Rx code that I wrote four months ago, and, and what does it really do? Like, I, these, these, are all, these are all questions I, I asked. Um, so I can answer a few of these. I'm, that's what this talk's about. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited about this talk, because usually when I go to a conference, I end up having to explain what an observable is to folks. Uh, here, the Angular people have been really great about uh, promoting reactive programming, including it in, in Angular 2. There's been a lot of other talks that talk about observables. If you're sitting here and you're like, I still don't know what observables are, don't worry. I'm going to try to kind of explain it. But there's plenty of other resources out there, e even around this conference, for you to, to learn exactly what an observable is. So let's get to it. This is, we're talking about thinking reactively. So you know what an observable is, and you want to start using them. And uh, it's, it's hard. It's hard to, to kind of wrap your head around it when you're used to imperative programming. So you need to start viewing your events in terms of dependencies. So you, you, look, you look at something, for example, like a drag and drop. So a drag and drop is basically if you're going to write out what, what a drag and drop does, you say for each mouse down on some target, you start listening to mouse movements on the document until a single mouse up on the document. So when you, when you look through what you're doing here, you can identify three different sets of events that we have to compose together. These are, these are our kind of dependencies to our one sort of event that we're trying to build. We're trying to build a single drag and drop event. So let's, uh, let's make those things. So let, I'm going to start off, and this is we're actually just going to select a DOM element. Uh, this isn't Angular specific. Uh, we'll select a DOM element, and we'll create a, an observable from uh, mouse down events on our target. We'll create one from uh, mouse movements on our document and one from mouse ups on our document. Now remember, these are observables. They don't do anything until you subscribe to them. I'm basically just setting up functions here. And then we, we go back and we look and we say, OK, well, what are we, what, what are we doing inside of this? Well, we, we, in this, this little highlighted section here, we see that we're, we want to compose mouse movements on the document until a single mouse up. Well, I can do that really easy with, with Rx. So that's just mouse moves take until mouse up. Again, this is just setting up an observable. It does not do anything until you subscribe to it. So now we've basically got this kind of function that, that's going to set up a, an event stream of mouse movements until a mouse up on the document. And then the first part of it was, uh, for each mouse down on the target, you start listening to that thing that we just made. So what we can do is we can say, OK, for our uh, target mouse downs, I'm going to switch map because I've got this other async, asynchronous thing I want to start. And I'm going to just 
plug in that, uh, that, that previous piece, piece that I made, that mouse movements take until mouse ups. And that's, that's drag and drop. So that, that's sort of the process that you have to think about when you're, when you're trying to think your way through these reactive things. It's, it's kind of backwards, but you have to identify your different uh, streams of events and then kind of look at your problem and see how to compose them together. So more thinking reactively. An another way to, to think about uh, observable is when you're looking at your imperative code and you're thinking, how do I convert this into something observable? Or you know, maybe, maybe you're trying to write something new and uh, you want to write it from scratch in observables, but you really only know how to do this imperatively. Uh, you can go into your code base and you can find any line of code and examine the variables. And what, what you need to know is that any given one of those variables is observable, right? So right here, we're looking, we're saying we want to we call do something with C. Uh, so if we, if we had a stream of C, we could subscribe to it and call do something with every time it nexts, right? And how do we get a stream of C? Well, C comes from adding A and B. So if we, if we uh, had streams of A and B, we could combine them and add them together with combine latest. Now, if, if you're just looking at this arbitrary section of code, uh, one thing to be aware of is there's, there's probably something that uh, caused either A or B or both of them to change, which is why you need to add them together again and call do something again. So then you would work your way backwards. You just keep working your way backwards and f figure out, well, how do I get a stream of A's and so on. So it's kind of, again, thinking reactively sometimes involves think, starting with your goal and then working your way backwards and identifying where you're getting these, these streams of information from and composing them together. So another, here's, here's, another, here's another one I get with people who start off, um, which is, oh my god, RxJS is so confusing. Uh, people get really, they're more comfortable with promises or something. They're, they're really, really stressed out about what operator she's so confusing. If, if you find it confusing, you're just starting out, stop worrying about the operators. <laughs> Seriously, stop worrying about the operators. Like, people get very excited about all these tools you just handed them, and it's scary to them. But you were probably com comfortable with promises before. So the promise here on the top, you'll see uh, you've got then, and it takes a success function, error function. Observable, you've got subscribe. It takes a next, an error, and a complete. Uh, it's really not that much different. One's one has more characters, I suppose. It's got another argument, right? But in all honesty, I mean, let's face it, you're probably only using the first argument in most of your thens. You're probably only using the first argument in most of your subscribes. Uh, so that's really not that much different. If you still think it's different, I'll change the names for you. Uh, quick draw McGraw and, and quick draw McDraw, uh, both using callback. Now I really, I, I don't even know which one was which from before. Uh, but Basically, without operators, observables are no scarier than promises. You could, you could start using observables right now, and if the operators are freaking you out, just subscribe to them, do imperative programming after that, and that's step one. That's actually how I, I started, because I didn't know all the operators. Maybe you can get your feet wet with map. That's pretty easy for people to wrap their heads around. That's just a, a good starting point if, if you don't know what to do. Maybe. Might be too scary. Which brings us to the next question which, <laughs> that I get, <laughs> what operator do I use? Uh, I, wanna, I wanna build all these things and it's gonna be amazing and I'm, they're gonna be so reactive. What operator do I use? People, people get all uh, jarred about that. Remain calm, it's okay. Uh, so let's talk about the operator agony. When we're agonizing over what operator we wanna deal with. Uh, first of all, you can use the operator guide at reactivexio slash rxjs. That's where our docs are. There's a really, really cool uh, guided process that hel to help you pick what operator you should be using at the bottom of the page. Um, developed by Andre Stoltz, good stuff. Uh, and remember, you don't have to RX everything. Like some people, when they're getting bent out of shape, they wanna do something reactive is because they, they're trying to kind of overuse uh, RxJS. Uh, just take the operators that you know and get them up to the point where you can get them and then subscribe and do the rest imperatively if, if that's what you have to do. It's totally fine. Um, this is a, just so everyone sees, this is a screenshot. If you do go to reactivexio slash rxjs, uh, down there at the bottom, that's where you will find the, the guided uh, choose your own adventure operator uh, finder thing. It's pretty cool. 
I recommend actually starting with these operators. Uh, I work on a lot of, of apps at Netflix, and I help people uh, on the internet and friends that, uh, that use RxJS. And especially when I have experience porting you know, Rx4 and 2 and stuff over to RxJS5, I get a real first-hand look at how many operators people have, what operators are they using. These are really the most common ones. Um, map, filter, scan, merge map, switch map, combine latest, and concat and do. Uh, there's, there's a few more that come up a lot, demounts, time, things like that, if people are doing client-side rate limiting. But these are the big ones. These are the ones that most people uh, end up using a lot. So there's 60 plus operators. Start with these and work your way up from there. You'll, you'll be a little bit more comfortable. All right, so this is where I'm going to dive into some uh, deeper technical stuff about what an observable is doing. I, I want to try to demystify observables a, a little bit because people look at uh, observables and they're like, what is happening inside this? There's this class and it's doing async things and it must be unicorns and dark magic in there. I don't know what's happening. It's, it's very, there's schedulers and all this stuff, right? It's, People get freaked out about uh, what an observable is really doing. And, and it might, some of that might be coming from promises, because promises do have you know, forced async behavior and some nuance where it's catching errors and, and things like that. Uh, but what if I told you that an observable is nothing but a function? I know I've said this already a little bit in my talk, but it really is true. And, and to prove it to you, I'm actually going to show you what it's like to build an observable that's just a function. So if, observables, if an observable was just a function, it would be a function that just took an observer. Right, that's, that's all it would do is it, it's just a function that, that accepts an observer. Easy, easy peasy. Uh, it's going to call a few methods on that, ob that uh, observer. Uh, here I'm, I'm setting up an interval and I'm nexting out uh, uh, technically 11 values and then, or yeah, 10 values actually, and then I'm calling complete uh, when that's done. And uh, the other thing it does is it returns some teardown logic. So in this case, it's just returning a function that clears the interval uh, that I can call at a later point to, to tear it down. Whenever I call the function, I call it with an observer. And the observer is just a, a plain object with a next error and complete method on it. Um, and it, it actually, it, you, just, you just pass that in. That's, that's, that's your own subscribe, if you will. So you get that teardown back, and, and later you can, you can uh, unsubscribe with that. Right? This is where our teardown comes out. We're getting it, and we're, we're calling it at a later point in a set timeout in this case. So to move on from that, operators are also just functions. Operators are functions that take an observable and return a new observable. In this case, this is just a function that's returning the same observable, but it's still an operator. I don't know. It'd be like a no operator. <laughs> Anyways. So we, we know that an observable is a function that takes an observer. So we can replace observable with a function that, that uh, takes an observer. And inside of that, what we're actually going to do, an operator is going to subscribe to the source, uh, that source observable, with its own observer. And then it's going to take the observer it was passed and actually, uh, actually end up calling that from inside its own observer. So it's, it's kind of taking an observer and wrapping it with its own observer so it can do something. So we'll make this a map operator. So in order to make this a map operator, all I really did was I, I renamed it map, for one, and then I passed in a mapping function, and I'm calling that mapping function before I next to that destination observer. Right? So there's, there's two observers inside here. There's the one that I'm, that object literal that I'm passing to that return observable on the inside, and then there's another one that I'm actually passing values through to and I'm also calling a map function. So if we use it with our observable we created earlier, it would look like this. We were calling map, we're passing our observable to it in a mapping function, uh, and then we're going to go ahead and subscribe to it and just log it out, and it's going to next out these values. So that's pretty cool. We got, we got, one, we got one mapping in there. What, what's it going to look like if we chain him? OK, well. We got map and then another call to map with my observable in it and then two functions in there. It's, that's all right. And what happens? Cool, it comes out with it's, it's actually chaining, uh, getting the exclamation point and the question mark in there back to back. But what happens when we want to do a lot of operators? We got, uh, let's see, we've got an observable, we're scanning it, then we're mapping, then we're filtering it, then we're mapping it a couple times. It's pretty gross. 
It's really not cool. Maybe we could do some code formatting to make this better. Nope, still gross. <laughs> um, so I think a nicer API would be if we could do dot chaining. Uh, dot, dot chaining enables us to have this much easier to read format. So let's wrap our observable functions in a class so we can have dot chaining. Uh, and uh, all we're going to do is we're going to have this, this class called observable, and we're going to have the constructor accept the observable, observable function we were making before, and we're just going to set it as a property on our class. And then, then whenever we want to invoke our observable, we, just, we, just, uh, we, we uh, actually just call this observable function on our, our observable instance. But that's not the best name in the world. We could probably change that to subscribe. All right, so anyone that's used observables now, this is starting to look very familiar, right? Um, but now we can actually add operators to the class. And when we add operators to the class, and the operators are also returning a new instance of the same class, that means whatever they return has the same operator, and you can chain them together. Right? Now it's much, much more readable. And I didn't actually change that much from the code. This, this map operator that's in here, the code, the code for it is almost identical to what I showed, showed you earlier. I just refactored it a little bit so it could be a member on this, on this class. So when I, when I run this, I get my, my uh, map chain executes, and, and it's much, much prettier to read. So observable as a class provides dot chaining, uh, the ability to uh, add safety to the type. So one of the, one of the things that observable does inside uh, of itself is it makes sure that you've passed, if you only passed a, a next handler, it's going to rough in uh, error handler and a completion handler for you to do some de default behaviors. It's also going to uh, kind of wrap your observer and make sure there's guarantees, like you can't call next after it's completed, and you can't call uh, you know, error after it's completed, and so on. If you can't call next after it's aired, and all these things. Um, so it also provides some performance optimizations in Rx. We can look at the, some properties in the class and make decisions about what we want to do with it in certain, in certain operators. Uh, scalar values can be processed a little quicker that way. Uh, but really, really, all that it's actually there to do is wrap that observable function. It's just a function that takes an observer. So think of observables as functions. Don't, don't think of them as anything else. They're not doing anything when you've been handed them. They're not running anything. They're just, they're just functions. So functions, again, don't do anything until they're called. The observables are lazy. That's another word you'll hear a lot. It just means that you have to subscribe to it before it'll do anything. Uh, operators uh, take your observable and return a new observable. OK, so operators return an observable, and an observable doesn't do anything until So just calling map is not going to execute anything in your observable. That, uh, that's a misunderstanding that I've seen a few times as well. I want you to notice something else, too. So this is my map operator from before. Uh, so if you look at this map operator, you see that I'm returning a function, which is I'm returning an observable, but we can think of it as a function. And inside of it, it's creating an observer, what's, what's in white, and passing values to another observer, which is in green. So it's, it's kind of chaining these observers together. It's, it's, it's when you call the function, it's basically saying, oh, I'm going to set up a, a whole bunch of observ observers that are all talking to each other. Um, that's an observable chain, right? So uh, it's just a, a function that connects cha chains of observers. So you've got a safe observer at the top where you're, where you're producing your data. You've got one for your filter, one for your map, and then one at the bottom that's uh, your wrapped observer. Uh, in this case, it would take your next handler and wrap it in observer. And it's, it's actually chaining them together, to, together just like you saw before. So let's actually visualize this. So I've got this uh, observable interval. And in my observable in interval, I'm going to, uh, after that, I'm going to filter it, and then I'm going to map it, and then I'm going to subscribe and do something, you know, log it out, or whatever I'm going to do with those values. So these rectangles here will represent observers. And I have one for my producer at the head. Uh, the other thing to note is that each one of those represents a different notification channel. My next channel, uh, my, my air channel, and my complete channel, those, those uh, horizontal lines going across. So I have one for my producer at the head. I have one observer for my filter, one for my map, and then finally one that wraps my handlers. So if I'm stepping through this, the producer next zero to the filter. So the producer next zero at the, at the filter observer. 
the filter observer passes for zero when it runs that, that uh, assertion on it. And then it nexts along to map. And the value is mapped and sent along. Zero plus zero is zero. And then it does whatever the handler is going to do, logs it out or something. Next, we're going to send along one. One goes to the filter and does not pass. So if, if it doesn't pass, uh, it's not going to be sent along. That's it. So what about error handling? Uh, error handling is, is, this is probably one of the bigger points of confusion for people. Uh, so I'm going to spend a bit of time on that. Uh, a thing to know about observers, observers actually have rules. Uh, observers will no longer pass along values uh, if error has been called, if complete has been called, or if you have unsubscribed. At that point, the observer will be closed. Uh, there's actually a, a Boolean on it that gets set that tells you that it's closed. And it will no longer allow you to, to next out things or, or error. So what does that mean for error handling? So let's look at this, this contrived example. We've got an interval again. And in my interval, I'm going to uh, throw a, an error uh, whenever I hit the, the value 1. So I'm, first, it sends 0. And that goes along. And we map it, which we're not actually doing anything with it. And it makes it to our subscription. Uh, the next time we send along 1, and 1 throws in our map. So the observer, right then and there, that particular observer is rendered inert. It's, it's marked as closed because error has been called on it. Nothing can pass through it at, at that point. You can't next on it, you can't error, you can't complete, which means that everything upstream from it is gone. It can't, it, it's, it can't send anything through anymore. And then the error is signaled down the chain. And uh, after that, you're done. So to handle an error, we have the catch operator. And just to explain how this works, it, it takes a function uh, that gives you the error, and you're expected to return an observable that it's going to uh, use in, in place of the observable that just failed. So it's very similar to promise catch in its structure. But what it's doing under the hood is a little different because we're dealing with observables. So using catch on the same sort of example, this, this time I've got an observable of just the value 1. And map's just going to throw because it hates ones. I don't know who writes code like this, but I do. Um, and we're, we're going to catch that and return an observable too. So what's going to happen here is we send the one. Map fails because it hates ones for whatever reason. And then we, we send the error to the, the error handler on catch. Well, the catch observer uh, had just had its error handler called, so that means that it is now closed. But what it's going to do is it's going to say, hey, let's, um, let's actually map this to this new observable of 2. And so it creates a new observer to subscribe to that observable of 2. And we, we set up our error channels again. And, and then we signal along 2 to the, to the next handler. And then after that, because it's an of, it's going to complete right afterwards, which means that that one is now closed and done. And we're all done. So what's, what's happening there is catch is saying, yeah, this, this died up here, but I'll, I'll provide this other observable for you to finish out your, your process. So but, but catch, you know, it still let our, our uh, whole observable die. Everything upstream from it is, is now gone. And when, when you run into uh, certain situations, you don't really want that. So how do, you, how do you solve that problem? How do you keep your observable from dying when you catch an error? This is, a, again, a very common question. You isolate your observer chains. So we know we now are setting up these chains of, of observers whenever we're dealing with uh, observables. So let's talk about the, the interval you don't want to die. So th in this case, we're doing something where we're polling. Every, every 10 seconds, we're going to make some uh, AJAX call. And uh, if it fails, which it very well could, uh, we, we don't want it to die. So this is what most people try at the beginning. And this isn't going to work, and I'm going to show you why. But um, what's going to happen is first we send along 0, and we're going to make our AJAX request. That's actually going to start a brand new observable. So that's, that's kind of off to the side. And it's going to wire things up to signal back into our switch map observer. And uh, what's, what's going to happen is when it, when it merges the value back in, it, that's just going to be passed through, because we'll say this, this first AJAX request was successful. And it's going to go all the way. It gets passed through catch, because catch doesn't care about next handling. Uh, right to our, our next handler. The next time we're going to send one, and this time I'm going to say that this AJAX observable is going to die. So this, this AJAX observable, we, we set it up. 
we subscribe to it, and it's got errors. So if it has errors, then both of these have had their error handlers called. They're closed. You can't send anything through them anymore. That means that everything upstream from that, including the interval, is now dead. Or, well, it, at the very least, it can't send anything through. So what do we do? The catch observer is like, OK, well, it's, it's closed. And, and we're actually going to replace that with an empty, because that's what it mapped to. Empty just uh, completes right away. It doesn't have any value. And the whole thing is done. So, oops, that's not good. That's a, <laughs> how do you keep an interval alive, Ben? How? Countless, countless emails. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's solve this. What if we put the catch inside of the switch map? If we put the catch inside of the switch map, let's see what happens. I'm just going to jump right to the error scenario here. So the interval fires. The switch map uh, creates the AJAX observable, and this, this time with a catch. So now we've got this, this observable chain sitting off to the side. And the catch, the, the, the AJAX is going to err. And that error is going to go to our catch. Our catch is going to map to a new, um, a new observable of empty. And empty completes. But switch map has this behavior where it says, hey, uh, my source isn't complete yet, so I don't really care if this child observable is complete. I'm going to keep going. So while that one dies, the, the external, the main observable chain, the main observer chain, stays alive. So when the interval fires again, switch map fires, we create another AJAX, you get the idea. So what happened? We created a second observer chain. When, whenever you have an error, your observer chain dies. So if you can isolate your observer chain, you won't have a problem, particularly if you punctuate that second observer chain with a catch or a retry or something that prevents that error from being pushed back down into the main observer or the main observer chain. So that's, that's going to shield our main observer chain. That's, that's what we want. So the TLDR of this is when handling errors, you probably want your catch inside of a merge operation of some sort, merge map, switch map, what, what have you, unless it's OK for, for your, observer, your observable to die, in which case, handle it wherever you choose. Uh, another, another thing that I see when I'm, I'm helping people, and they'll, they'll end up with some memory leaks or something like that, uh, subscription management mistakes. This is, this is, very, this is very common, uh, and that usually comes from failing to unsubscribe. So failing to unsubscribe will cause memory leaks, resource leaks of various sorts, because unsubscription is what tears down the resources you set up when you subscribe to begin with. So think about like add event listener, right, and remove event listener. I think a lot of us have probably set up an event listener and forgotten to remove it. And we're like, I don't know why this is using megs and megs of RAM on my machine. Like, crazy. Like a whole gig on Chrome. That's amazing. So this is, uh, this is one way to manage your subscription. And inevitably, you will have to do this with Rx, man managing imperatively. You will, at some point, have to create a subscription and later on unsubscribe. And so people end up wanting to do this everywhere. And they end up with something like this. Now, when you look at this, I mean, who here can spot the one that I missed? Yeah, four was missing. It's really easy when I line them up like that. Um, but but what, is, what is it like when, it, when all that stuff is mixed into all the rest of your code? Right? When it's sprinkled throughout this, this, compl this complex application, it becomes very, very easy to miss something and cause leaks. So there's another way to do this. You can manage mostly declaratively. You still have to have a subscription in there somewhere. So in, in order to manage uh, declaratively, you can do things like take until. So take until accepts any observable. So in this case, I've got these kill observables up here that one's coming from button clicks, one's coming from a stream of route changes, however you got that. One's a subject. And that basically means that you can kind of take all your observables, merge them into one so you only have one subscription. And use take until to kill them individually if you want to. Uh, the other thing you could do in this, and I'm not actually featuring it, is you could add a do block after each one of those take untils to handle the subscribe logic individually for each one of those streams if you wanted, if you didn't want to handle it all in your subscribe uh, later on. 
But there's a lot of ways to handle this declarative subscription management. There's things like take, take until, take while, first, that all kind of behave similarly. There's also switch and switch map, which have an inherent like, unsubscription uh, behavior built into them. Um, so uh, the, the good sides of, of declarative subscription management are that you have fewer subscriptions to manage, so you're less likely to miss one of those uh, and forget to unsubscribe. You, the, the other thing that's interesting is you can use any event stream to trigger an unsubscribe, which means if you have some stream, stream of like, this is to kill my Ajax call or whatever, you can compose whatever you want in it to make sure that that still happens. Um, and again, you can compose this any number of ways. I mean, anything that can be an observable, you can use to uh, kill your other observables. So there's another approach to subscription management, though, is let your framework or libraries handle it for you. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of libraries and frameworks have uh, handling for RxJS observables built in. In particular, Angular 2 has pipe async. So it looks kind of like what you see at the bottom where you've got this pipe async after where you're writing out this uh, foo observable. So just a really some pseudocode example here. If you have a template, you can write out foo with pipe async. And then on your component, if you have this observable interval, it, as it updates, it will cause your view to update. There is a gotcha to this, though, that a lot of people don't realize. And the gotcha is that, um, well, for one thing, I want to I note that right here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to log out when the timer is fired. Now, a timer, just so everybody knows, is like a set timeout. It's going to fire one time and give us, a, give us a value, and that's it. So I should only see, most people would expect to only see timer fired logged out one time. But when I run this, I actually see it fired twice. And people, and this is people, well, I don't know why this is happening twice, because if, let's say it's an Ajax call or something underneath there, then you've made that Ajax call twice. People uh, get bent out of shape about, about that. They don't like that. And um, why is that? Well, because you've created two subscriptions. And as I've stated for most of this talk, uh, observables are just functions. They don't, they, they don't have any state or anything. They're, they're just going to, oh, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to set up um, this, this whole the observer chain every time you subscribe to me all the way up to the top. So it does that twice, all the way up to the top, sets up the timer twice in this case, and the timer fires twice. So here's how we fix that. We fix that by adding a share uh, to, to the, the end of our observable chain. What that's going to do is it's going to multicast. Um, basically means that it's going to wait for the first thing to subscribe to it. That'll set up the observer. Uh, the observer chain, and then the next guy that uh, subscribes to it is going to get wired into that same observer chain. It's, it, uh, when that observer chain fires, it's going to broadcast to everybody that's, that's listening. Um, but fair warning, uh, multicasting comes with costs. So the costs around multicasting is you're going to end up allocating a subject, you're going to end up allocating an array to stuff all your observers in, you'll end up allocating a couple more uh, subscriptions. So you don't want to multicast all over the place. If you find yourself doing share, 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 take a step back and, and examine what you're doing and, and why. So pipe async has some pros. The pros are no subscription management at all, which is good. Uh, and the other thing that's really cool is you've got this automatic unsubscription when something is removed from your view. That's actually cool. Let's say you had like a WebSocket or something feeding in to some data and you wanted it and you had it set up so your observable closed the WebSocket when you unsubscribed. Um, that means that as soon as you if something out of your view, your WebSocket will automatically close. So it's it's really it's really a cool way to kind of consume observables. However, the, the con to this is that it can encourage the overuse of, of multicasting. So people using share all over the place. And that, that can impact performance. But a good uh, subscription rule of thumb that I use is more than two is probably too many. Uh, if, if I find myself managing three, four, five observables in, in a single component or a, a single module, then I, or managing that many subscriptions rather in, in a single module, uh, I think to myself, eh, this is, I've probably gone overboard on this. Maybe I should use a more declarative approach. All right, so this is the, the final point um, that I'm going to make here. And, and this, the very first talk I actually ever did uh, for uh, the Angular community was at ng-conf a couple years ago. And it was actually called Rx All the Things. I'm going to contradict myself. Do not Rx all the things. Um, you can build your app as one big observable, but please don't. 
I've seen this. I've seen it. I, I, have, I obviously have a lot of friends in the RX community, and I've, I've had some really brilliant people come to me and, Ben, check this out. I made a whole code REPL, and it's all just one observable. You can subscribe to it, and it does everything. I'm like, really? I'd like to see that. And I look at it, and I'm like, wow, there's probably five people in the world that can read this. <laughs> um, it's, you know, Rx is a, is a domain-specific language. Uh, it, it takes a while to learn it. Once you learn it, it's extremely powerful. It makes all your code very terse, very readable. Um, but you should really use Rx where it's best suited. So it's best suited for doing things like composing multiple events together, like what I showed you for drag and drop. Um, I've done other things where I had to do like brush selection on a graph where you click and you select like a little range or whatever. Things like that it works really, really well for because it's very easy to, to modify those sorts of things and, and alter it declaratively. It's good for doing things like adding delay or uh, client-side rate limiting for debouncing or you know, maybe setting a timeout, things that involve uh, adding some sort of timing to, to your events. Uh, it's also really good for coordinating async tasks. So if you have a bunch of different things happening asynchronously and you want to kind of make sure that when they all come in, they, they come in together or that you're, you're coordinating you know, various things, maybe WebSockets and workers and whatever. It's really, really good for that. Um, and it's also great when cancellation is required. So if you have AJAX requests you want to be able to cancel or abort, like I talk about in all, most of my other talks, uh, it's, it's, they're fantastic for that. However, do not use Rx when it's not needed. If you've just got simple button clicks, you don't need an observable to add an event listener to a button. Like, that's, that gets a little silly. Uh, basic forms use, you're just typing something in a form you want to submit. You don't need an observable to wrap everything in your form and update something so you can submit it later. Uh, Hello World apps, your Hello World app does not need Rx, all right? I can tell you for a fact that, and I've, I'm sad to say that I've actually seen that. Um, so, thinking reactively, just to, just to recap, uh, when, you, when you think reactively, you want to kind of work backwards. You think about your goal, and then you think about what all of your, you know, your event streams that you're going to need to build that goal, to, to build together like Lego pieces to, to get to that goal. Uh, any variable can be an observable. Anything that you look at, just, just again, imagine that code executes once in a while over time, and that variable changes. That's a value that changes over time. It can be represented as an observable. Observables are just functions. There's no deep magic inside of them. Uh, don't be scared. You use functions every day. You'll be fine. Uh, but observables get too much credit. Observer chains do all the work. An observable just sets up this chain of observers, and then it, it goes away. It's, it's just a function. You call it, and it's done. Uh, they're templates to set up these observer chains. Uh, everybody talks about observables. Really, it's the observers that matter. Um, calling error actually will break that chain. So that's, that's an important thing to note. Observers have rules. If you error, complete, or unsubscribe, uh, that, that observer in your chain is done. And you, just remember your subscription management rules. If two, two or three or more is probably too many subscriptions in a single component. In my opinion, I mean, if you like that sort of thing, go nuts. Uh, make, sure to make sure to have tests around that, though. Um, and then uh, only use Rx where it makes sense. I, I love Rx. I think it's really cool when people show me stuff uh, like that REPL I was talking about, uh, where it's just like one big observable. It's, it's so much fun to, to get into this stuff. That's why I'm into it. Um, but I, you know, don't make your team hate you. <laughs> don't, don't go out and be like, oh, I, I, look, check this out. I flat mapped 35 things, and like our whole app is in here now. It's great. No, your, your team will not like you if you do that. Even if they think, wow, this person really knows their Rx, uh, I, I would recommend against that. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>